Hi, my name is Greg Brewer. I am the Bishop of the Diocese of Central Florida. I am happy today to introduce to you our report of our experience and what happened at the 80th General Convention of the Episcopal Church that took place in Baltimore, Maryland. It was an incredibly demanding time. All of your deputation worked extremely hard, and I'm very grateful for what they were able to do, both in terms of networking with other deputations, the speaking they did on the floor of the House of Deputies, as well as just the hard work of showing up, being there, paying attention, through four very, very long and demanding days. I want you to know that this video is in fact meant to be a replacement for the in-person meeting that we typically have. The reason we did that was that we thought a professionally run video would in fact be far more helpful in the end than meeting at a location because honestly, crowds at those have diminished over the course of the years. And this is something far more accessible. You can show it at a coffee hour. You can relate it to a friend. And so this is the reason that we chose the venue and the format that we did to be able to give you what we hope will be, will be a very helpful piece of reporting. The only other thing common I want to make in terms of this introduction is to be able to say that this video does not duplicate the reporting that I did over the course of the General Convention. Each evening, I did a 10-minute video of what happened that day. If you would like that information, please go to the website that appears on your screen, and that way you can watch immediately all four of those, because as I said, that content will not be repeated today. Instead, this will be a far more general summation. My name is Phyllis Bartle. I serve as Chair of the Deputation of Central Florida. Um, chair meaning I lead the deputies, especially the new ones, and try to explain some of the terminology that may be unfamiliar. And I like to tell everybody we are a deputation, not a delegation. As a deputation, we have been deputized to come to the convention, bringing our own thoughts and ideas as opposed to a delegation where they're delegated to do what the will of the diocese is. And so that's, that's just one of the many things that a chair of a deputation takes care of. This was a very different kind of a convention. Although we dealt with the same kinds of resolutions, there were several concerns over, the, over health with COVID being a part of the, our daily routine in that we were to wear masks at all times not just on the convention floor, but in any indoor space, hotels, restaurants. And we were provided with COVID daily testing so that we could make sure that no one was going to spread the virus. And as it turned out, by the end of convention, after four days of convention, we only had 27 of the over 900 people who had tested positive. So it was, it worked. One of the other decisions that came out because of that was to shorten up the convention we met for only four days instead of the traditional eight or nine days. And those four days we had morning, afternoon and evening sessions. So it was very, it was as intense as a regular convention, but just a lot shorter. One of the things they did to assure that we could get everything done in the time frame was to have our, um, all the committees met via Zoom in order to deliberate on the resolutions that came before each committee. My committee, I was, I served on number 14, the uh, formation and Christian formation committee. And we had about six different meetings to go through each and every resolution that was coming our way. But that allowed us to clean up and, and um, perfect the resolutions that ended up coming to the convention. People noticed our deputation the way they spoke up, the relationships they built across the aisle, both geographically as well as theologically. But one of the things that stood out, and in fact, in contrast to most of the other deputations was the diversity of who showed up. There was a huge variety from a recent college graduate to the more seasoned, that's the word I like to use, people who were present as well as 
Latin Americans, as well as Afro-Caribbeans, as well as Afro-Americans, as well as Anglos. Honestly, most of the deputations were far more monochrome, either in age, but particularly in terms of race. They were usually all Anglo or all African-American or all Afro-Caribbean. And so in many ways, people were surprised that we were as diverse as we were, because given the fact that Central Florida has a reputation for being more conservative, they, th they would assume that we're all older Anglo adults. And of course, as you know, if you live here in Central Florida, that is far from the case. And in fact, we have vibrant congregations that really reach across age bands. One of the other things that happened was that the work that we did often dovetailed nicely with the work of the communion partners. The communion partners is a group of bishops, priests, deacons, and lay people who work together to build relationships across the broader Anglican communion and take a position that is far more biblical and traditional than some of our other brothers and sisters. They worked hard, particularly the bishops, to organize and speak up. The big concern, they, of course, they have is the long-term impact of the resolutions that are passed and also to make sure that there continues to be a place in the church for more theologically conservative members, as opposed to them being sequestered off or creating resolutions that in the end will come into effect so that the people who come after sort of the old men bishops who are there uh, will be far more uh, less conservative than we are. We worked hard at that, and you will hear more reporting later about what we did, but I was very pleased with the work we were able to accomplish. Hi, I'm Chrisita Jackson, a member of your Central Florida Deputation to General Convention. I'm a member of the Deputies of Color Caucus and the Black Caucus to the Convention and serve, uh, I have served for three years um, or three conventions as the Secretary of the Privileges and Courtesies Com um, Committee in the House of Deputies. It's been my pleasure to serve. I love serving on uh, this committee because uh, Privileges and Courtesies pretty much uh, recommends, commends, uh, thanks, you know, it's a positive uh, committee. During uh, this um, general convention, the deputies of color and the Black Caucus submitted 17 resolutions uh, to the convention, uh, a number of them uh, centering around racial justice issues, which is, has been signif significant in the uh, time of a bishop, a presiding Bishop Curry. There are a couple of uh, resolutions that particularly concerned me. One was the adoption of uh, February 11th as a feast day for Barbara Harris. Barbara Harris was the first woman bishop consecrated in the Anglican Communion. And also uh, a resolution that I, I like to see happen was the adoption of Lift Every Voice and Sing as the national hymn. I was disappointed to um, see that the House of Bishops did not concur on a resolution which would have established a clergy retirement fund for small parishes and missions uh, in order that they could support a clergy person in, it, in their retirement. There was a resolution that uh, I think did pass regarding school to prison pipeline for young minorities. The Episcopal Church has spoken out against this, as well as the um, health care issue. The Episcopal Church is supporting access to good health care for all women, children, all people of whatever uh, station in life. I was saddened at the convention uh, to learn of the death of Canon Nelson Pender. I've known Canon Pender most of my life. I originally met him at an EYC weekend retreat at Camp Wingman when I was in high school. 
But he's always been a part of my life. I've been a, a member of his parish church. I have served and ministered with Father Pender, and that has given me the most joy to have the opportunity to learn at his feet, to be a receiver of counsel from him. He has helped make me a better Christian and a better church woman. My name is Jose Rodriguez. I am the co-rector at Christ the King Episcopal Church and the vicar at Iglesia Episcopal Jesus de Nazaret. For General Convention 80, I was elected by the convention of this diocese to be a clergy deputy. As a clergy deputy to the 80th General Convention in Baltimore, I served on the Social Justice and U.S. Policy Committee. My wife and I also wrote many resolutions that passed. At General Convention, the first thing that hit us was the absence of many of our members from Province 9. These deputies represent an important voice within the Episcopal Church. Not only unique theological perspectives, but also unique languages and cultures that add to the body of Christ united together at General Convention. Entire deputations were missing, from Honduras to Ecuador and Venezuela, and only three members from Colombia were able to make it. Cuba was completely gutted and only their bishop was able to make it. This was a reminder to all of us of the importance of justice, justice around the issues of all of our members attending General Convention. My wife and I wrote a resolution for promoting access to General Convention. In the previous convention, we had written a resolution for scholarships and financial assistance to assist members of General Convention deputies to making it to General Convention. This time around, we were not only faced with the pandemic, but we were also faced with many of our brothers and sisters in Province 9 who were unable to make it because they were not able to obtain visas to enter the United States. My wife and I, Heather Rodriguez, lay deputy, wrote D089 to ensure equitable access to all our deputies to General Convention. This passed and now our Executive Council of the Episcopal Church has been charged with finding ways to allow all of our Province 9 members to make it through the immigration process so they can attend General Convention 81. There are many hurdles that keep our Province 9 members from attending. We hope that with this one building upon the one we did last time, we make it more and more accessible for all voices of the Episcopal Church to attend General Convention. The abbreviated format of General Convention really suppressed a lot of conversations from happening that needed to happen. We were hoping to go into this general convention to discuss language access, the translation of our liturgies to the languages spoken throughout our Episcopal Church, specifically the Spanish language that is spoken throughout this diocese. Those conversations have been pushed over to the next general convention. One conversation that did occur that was very important was A059. One of the things that struck out to me with A059 was that our bishops voted it in unanimously. In those moments, in those unanimous moments of meeting together and agreeing, the Holy Spirit moves. So I do hope as we look forward to General Convention 81, that same spirit of unity informs us as we tackle many, many important issues around our liturgies, not just renewal, but access and making our liturgies accessible to all of our members. I'll leave it to Deputy Heather Rodriguez to speak about the three resolutions that she wrote. Earlier, we spoke about equitable access for deputies to convention. There were two other very critical and important pieces of legislation that were passed at this general convention. One was defining the church's teaching on racism. Believe it or not, there were four places in our national canon and constitution where the church's teaching on racism was spoken about, was written about, was enumerated. However, there is no teaching on racism in the Episcopal Church. Until now, this convention defined the church's teaching on racism, invited others to expand upon it, and most importantly, to all of us who thirst for justice, it anathematized racist behavior. Now in the Episcopal Church, racist behavior, racist teaching, 
is an anathema to the church. It is a very important thing for those of us who've been victims, who've been suppressed or oppressed. General Convention has spoken, and not only have we defined the church's teaching on racism, but we have stated that it is foreign to the body of Christ. It is repugnant to the body of Christ in the most strongly possible theological words. Racism is now an anathema in the Episcopal Church. Finally, the final resolution that we wrote and passed was defining an equal place for our laity in the church. As a priest, I'm aware and I've seen that many times my fellow clergy reduce the role of the laity. We turn places that are supposed to be mutual ministry into places that are clerical led bodies. Defining the place of the laity, defending their rights to access to leadership, defines a way forward where priest and laity alike serve in mutual ministry, honoring the body of Christ, according to our own catechism that lifts up the ministry of the laity, uniting us and honoring Christ in a shared and mutual ministry in the Episcopal Church. Hi, my name is Justin Holcomb. I serve as the Canon for Vocations in the Diocese of Central Florida, and this was the second general convention where I got to serve as a deputy. I was at 2018 in Austin and 2022 in Baltimore. I'm here to report on the president election for the House of Deputies. Julia Ayala Harris was elected on the third ballot to serve as the president of the House of Deputies. She is the first laywoman to serve as the president and the first woman of color to serve as president. She is going to serve as the president of the House of Deputies through to the next, the end of the next general convention, which is in 2024. And she's up for re-election for at least two more terms. So thus, she could serve as the president for up to 2030. The president of the House of Deputies serves as the second ranking officer in the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society, which is the name for the Episcopal Church. And many announcements come under two signatures, the presiding bishops, and the president of the House of Deputies. So the significance of her role is enormous. And in her role as president of the House of Deputies, she serves as the vice president of the executive council, which is essentially the board of directors for the Episcopal Church. What stood out to me about her election is that she led from ballot one, and she seemed to be supported from a very wide breadth of constituents throughout the entire Episcopal Church. So she looks like a unifying person and, and just by anecdotal uh, you know report she was meeting with many people throughout the entire uh, general convention when she wasn't on the floor i saw her meeting with uh, the people that seemed to be supporting her the type of support she had was significant and it was beautiful to see the the strong support from a wide breadth throughout the episcopal church i'm looking forward to her leadership and continuing the leadership that she's already exhibited as she served as a deputy and served on various committees throughout the Episcopal Church. At one of our breaks in the legislative session, I had the opportunity to go and meet uh, President Harris, which was a, a great joy. Um, and you can read more about her on the website on the link, and I would encourage you to do so because there's a lot about her service to the church that is represented very well there. There are two things in particular that stood out to me. She was the co-author of one of the most comprehensive resolutions about intimate partner violence, sexual abuse, child abuse, stalking, and sexual harassment, which was to give and support, not give survivor rights, they have rights, but to support survivor rights and advocacy. So I've known about her for a while because of that work, and we got to touch base about that and the importance of that. And that's a continuation of the work from the previous president of the House of Deputies, the Reverend Gay Jennings. The Reverend Gay Jennings has left a wonderful mark because she has done work on survivor advocacy, sexual abuse, domestic abuse, survivor advocacy. One of the things that stood out from her tenure is that she uh, withdrew the statute of limitations for clergy who have sexually abused a child, making, making justice and truth telling possible regardless of the statute of limitations. And President Harris is going to be a continuation of that type of survivor care and advocacy. A second point that was relevant for me personally is her connection to South Sudan. I was ordained in South Sudan in 2006, 
after I'd been serving there throughout uh, numerous years since 2001 and continued after my ordination. So I have a connection to Nimali in Juba in South Sudan. And I've known that she has been connected there. Part of her, her bio references when she and her husband sold everything they had to move to South Sudan so she could help as that country was coming out of the Civil War and doing post-war development. And she was a key person in bringing different NGOs, non-government organizations to help serve throughout, not just from the United States, but multinational care for this new budding nation. And before I wrap up, I just have something else not related to the election that I'd like to say. I started following Bishop Brewer from a distance in 2012 when he was in Indianapolis for his first time as the diocesan bishop of the Diocese of Central Florida. I was watching this bishop on Twitter and Facebook carrying uh, huge binders, one under each arm, giving video updates and, and talking about the wisdom of wearing uh, running and walking shoes that he learned from the other deputies. So it was fun to uh, be able to serve in these past two general conventions. But what really stood out is that this is the last general convention where he will serve as the diocesan bishop. And it stood out to me because I've been able to watch him with his relationships with his peers and colleagues in the House of Bishops and other leaders in the House of Deputies, that one of his pillars has been throughout his episcopacy that we will take our seat in the councils of the church. And that's something that he has led the way on and watching him as an example, he, just like, just like President Julia Ayala Harris, she was speaking with everyone in the Episcopal Church. Bishop Brewer is an example of speaking with everyone across the spectrum, both in the House of Bishops and the House of Deputies. And he's been a wonderful example because I was there seeing the fruit of Bishop Brewer as an example as our deputies were doing the same thing, writing resolutions, working with different dioceses, and just being, uh, taking their seat, taking their role within the church. And I just wanted to acknowledge that something that Bishop Brewer set up as a goal, as something that he wanted to accomplish, it was a great joy to see the fulfillment of that, not only in his role at the general conventions that I've seen, but now throughout the deputation, serving the Episcopal Church in a similar way that he has, with joy, grace, gentleness, respect, and clarity. One of the moving moments during convention was when the deputation from the Diocese of Alabama uh, came up on the platform uh, for prayer and uh, to thank the members of uh, the Episcopal Church for their prayers and support after the uh, shooting that took place at St. Stephen's in Vestavia Hills outside of Birmingham. Uh, it was a very moving time, uh, lots of tears. Um, there was also an initial move to name the three people who died as heroes, uh, but the terminology was changed to martyrs uh, as they died for their faith and carrying out to serve and and feed the least, the lost uh, of all. And that uh, their commitment to the gospel command to reach out to the lost um, uh, actually cost them their lives. Um, there was also a motion to include uh, the other 18 people who were present uh, at the church during that uh, fateful uh, potluck dinner. and. Uh, it was, it was a good way to start convention off, uh, especially after the uh, shooting that had taken place um, at a nearby hotel. I had spoken with the Canon to the Ordinary from the Diocese of Alabama uh, the day of the shooting and uh, have stayed in touch with him um, since that time. And uh, he said, it's just amazing the support the prayers uh, and the help that's come from all over the church. This was my first uh, time as a deputy to general convention and going into the convention, uh, Bishop Brewer um, asked each of us to focus on one sp 
particular aspect um, of the resolutions. There were over 400 that were presented and uh, my task was to pay special attention to those that dealt with um, the prayer book, prayer book or revision and the liturgy and music commission. And uh, a part of the way the general convention was set up, uh, there was not really the opportunity for open discourse and debate. Uh, many of the items that came up uh, that were presented from Committee 12, which is prayer book, liturgy, and music, um, focused on um, issues that uh, we would have loved to have spoken to, but because they became a part of the consent agenda, uh, there really wasn't an opportunity to uh, debate um, significant issues. Uh, just to give you an idea, there were actually 62 resolutions that came forth from prayer book, liturgy, and music. Uh, many of them had to deal with revisions to the church calendar um, and including certain people in a list of uh, saints or saints days. Um, there were a few substantive pieces that came forth. Uh, one that was actually discussed in depth at the meeting of the House of Bishops. And that is uh, exactly what is the role of the prayer book and uh, how do we go about making uh, prayer book revision. One of the things that came out of the House of Bishops is that uh, past general conventions had perhaps overstepped their boundaries a bit and they were going through and modifying specific liturgies or suggesting that we include this aspect or that. And uh, all of that was at this convention really ruled out of order. Uh, the, the prayer book um, stands as a whole and it speaks uh, of our theological and liturgical grounding in Christendom. And to uh, revise it piecemeal uh, was really doing it uh, and the church a disservice. Um, so uh, it went back and forth at the House of Bishops and uh, there was finally a resolution that was passed by the House of Bishops that basically acknowledged that this is the standard um, uh, theological, one of the standard theological texts of the Episcopal Church and it was not to be um, revised in a piecemeal fashion. There were a few very specific things that came out, not really on the floor of convention, but as you go through the comparison of the consent agenda from the House of Deputies and the consent agendas that came forth from the House of Bishops. Uh, there were a few uh, good things that did come out. There's going to be a uh, revision of the Book of Occasional Services. Uh, it was last revised in 2018. There will be a 2021 revision uh, that is published. There was also um, a revision. Uh, you'll note there will be a revision in the calendar uh, at the very beginning of the prayer book. And uh, there were um, over 80 changes uh, that were recommended at the last general convention that have now been updated and they had to go through two readings and so this year was the second reading for uh, the inclusion of many of those people so there'll be a significant revision um, with many additions in the um, 20. 22 or 2023 calendar. There were also four additional people that were uh, asked to be included, but that won't be voted on until the 
81st General Convention in Louisville uh, in two more years. The last thing that uh, I think is very helpful, will be very helpful uh, to the church is that there is going to be an official website of the Episcopal Church that you can go to for all matters of uh, prayer book, uh, hymnal, uh, liturgical revision, and it will be maintained by the custodian of the Book of Common Prayer and uh, officers in a committee set up uh, by the Standing Liturgical Commission to make sure that that's up and current and accurate. And that website will be uh, www.episcopalcommonprayer.org and you will note uh, in the coming weeks and months that that will be populated with a lot of liturgical revisions uh, supplemental texts and it will also as it documents each of those it will explain what level of authorization it is currently at so for people who are prayer book geeks and want to know that kind of stuff uh, you'll be able to go and see exactly what the standing liturgical commission is doing um, but there is nothing uh, hugely substantive uh, the prayer book continues as our standard for worship. Uh, it will be able to be used in all of uh, the jurisdictions uh, of the Episcopal Church throughout its nine provinces in all dioceses. And uh, there was also a moment of clarity that said uh, that you will not be able to exclude it from the approved resources, uh, regardless of the actions of a local bishop. Hello, my name is Eric Perez. Not only am I a deputy for Central Florida, but I also serve as Assistant Secretary for Legislative Committee Number One, Rules and Order Rules of Order. Uh, we basically took care of um, setting up the rules for the General Convention to follow, not only now but in future uh, conventions as well. Our team was excellent, not only on the floor, but off the floor. We always uh, met each other. We prayed with each other. We rallied behind one another. We made sure there are alternates, Reverend Kay Mueller, Reverend Tracy Duggar, and Eric LeBron, which by the way, having two Eric's in one team made it really, really confusing. Every time somebody said Eric, we would just turn around. <laughs> But uh, we rallied for them so that way they could have time and experience on the floor. Especially Eric being our youngest member of the crew. Reverend Kim Mueller was amazing. She was, she spoiled us. She had lunch ready. She made sure that we had reservations for dinner. She gave us presents of all things. Just for us to like, you know, at least feel a little bit more at home. She prayed with us when we needed it. At least to me, it was like having a mom away from, you know, my own mother. <laughs> Greetings. I'm Kay Mueller from Okeechobee, Florida, Church of Our Savior. And I attended this year's 80th General Convention of the Episcopal Church as a deputation member and also as hospitality coordinator for the Diocese of Central Florida. It was my first convention and quite an exciting and enlightening and educational experience. In the role of hospitality coordinator, one of my responsibilities was to make sure that lunch was available in our meeting room every day when convention adjourned for lunch. All in all, the meeting space was uh, very well utilized, not only for lunch, but was used for the deputation to come together and to debrief and to receive assignments, to brainstorm comments that would be offered on the floor of convention and to generally fellowship with one another and to have time to pray together as a group. Additionally, part of my responsibilities as hospitality coordinator was to provide decoration for the tables on the floor of the convention. When you've got about 1,500 plus people in one room and multiple tables to accommodate each and every one of those attendees, it can be difficult to find your assigned area in entering at the last moment. 
Therefore, each table is decorated based on distinct aspects of the geographical area from which they come. So we have something very unique here in the Diocese of Central Florida on the Space Coast, and that is the Kennedy Space Center. So therefore, at the top of our pole that says Diocese of Central Florida, we had two rockets, two Mylar balloons that were rockets. And it was very helpful because as you came into the room, you knew immediately where to go. And when we would share with other people, oh, stop by and see me at our table, and they knew exactly where to come. So our rockets became very well known. As a deputation member and as an alternate, one of the responsibilities that I had was to be available to assist in the event that one of our other delegates needed some time away from the floor. I was blessed to get the opportunity on three separate occasions, twice to fill in for Canon Justin Holcomb and once for Canon Scott Holcomb. I found this to be a very exciting and educational process, and I was extremely impressed with the parliamentary procedures utilized throughout the convention. The nice thing was that when we checked in, we were all issued individual iPads, so no matter where you were in the convention space or even in your hotel space, you could log on to the general convention as you could from home and watch the proceedings in the House of Deputies or the House of Bishops. So you were never out of touch what, with what was going on at any given time. Most of all, I was impressed by the passion of those that got up to speak either in favor of a resolution or against a resolution or amendment and their dedication to serving our Lord and Savior. And most of all, my heart was touched that everything that was done at the 80th General Convention of the Episcopal Church was born out of love for God, love for the gospel, and love for our church. I was privileged to submit three resolutions to convention this year. Um, DO 93, broad representation in the discernment process. Um, D094, reaffirming the role of ethnic ministries. And D098, the promotion of public health. Those three all went to the consent calendar and were all passed uh, with the majority vote. My name is Mother Tracy Duggar, and I am the rector of the Episcopal Church of Nativity in Port St. Lucie, Florida. It was my privilege and honor to speak against D054 on the floor of General Convention. This resolution was a resolution made in order to restrict future locations in which General Convention could be held based on access to reproductive health care within the state in which was proposed. Now, when I spoke against this resolution, it was because I feel compelled that we are more than a church of New York, New Jersey, and California. And indeed, our whole church needs the witness that Jesus calls us to go into all the world for the sake of the gospel. Even when there is personal risk involved, Jesus sends us out like sheep among wolves to go and enjoy the hospitality of the places that welcome us. Now, I was privileged after this resolution failed to hear from many people at dinner and over breakfast, and even via Twitter message, that I helped to change the way they thought about this resolution. And I'm grateful to have done my part to represent our diocese well, that not only is Louisville an excellent place to hold general convention, but Central Florida remained on the list of proposed places for two conventions from now. It was a beautiful moment to watch Ayala Harris be elected as our new and future president of the House of Deputies. It was particularly emotional in that this is also the convention that we recognized women had been elected as deputies to general convention as early as 1949, but were not permitted to take their seat. Indeed, we honored many deputies who died having never been seated in general convention. And so to watch a young Latina get elected to represent our church was incredibly moving. I think this is speaking to you, that you will someday be here doing this with us. Keep being the church geek that you are. And her speech, she encouraged all of the church geeks, all of the people who love the process. Yes, we all 
get frustrated at times with the legislative process, but that those of us who trust that God and indeed the living power of the Holy Spirit is at work in the details, in the canons, and yes, on the floor of General Convention. She encouraged us to keep it up, to keep the faith, and to keep working, because look how far she came. I want to thank you for making the time to watch this video. Honestly, the success of General Convention, the capacity General Convention has to be able to reflect the full mind of its members has everything to do with members knowing what's going on, getting involved, writing people, and staying connected. And I also want to say in that light that if you have any follow-up questions that you would like to ask anyone on our deputation and me as well, there will be an email address that will appear on your screen that you can use to communicate with us directly. So again, thank you very, very much for the time that you made to be a part of this. Uh, continue to pray for the Episcopal Church, for our, dio our diocese, as well as the relationships that we have and foster with the broader Anglican communion. I'd like to close by offering a prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for birthing us not only into the body of Christ, but also placing us as newborns into this wondrous international fellowship of Christians. Thank you for the diversity and the comprehensiveness that we share together. Thank you for the fidelity that we have in you as our Lord. Thank you for the calling that you have given us to be your witnesses in all the world. Help us in our congregations and parishes and individually to live out the fullness of what it means to be members of the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion and warmly welcome people into this fellowship. So we commit the work that has been done and the work that has yet to be accomplished into your hands, asking that you would equip us with your Holy Spirit and wisdom to be able to do just that. So for all of this and the continuing journey that you've placed us on, we give you the praise and thanks. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.